Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Adam Steele for the Hot Pole Studios, and today we're going to talk about Pro Tools, specifically Pro Tools First. So, if you're watching this video, I'm guessing you're the kind of person who's just started getting into using digital audio workstations, sound recording, audio recording as a thing, so you're not yet a professional, or, or maybe you're just watching this video because you're interested in what Fro Pro Tools First is all about. Uh, so, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about Pro Tools first, specifically, and not the larger versions of Pro Tools, at least not in too much detail. So I'm going to be doing this as a kind of a tutorial, showing you how to get going with Pro Tools first, and what uh, it entails, what it's got, what it's not got, and the, what, the main thing is that it's free, at least... At least the, the bit that you get is free. The, there are plenty of things associated with Pro Tools First that are not free. And that's part of what we'll talk about today. So as you can see in front of us, this is the Avid website. This is the Pro Tools First page. So if we go here, you can see on the top right, it says get it now for free. You can have 16 audio tracks, four inputs. There are 20 plus plugins, three projects. Ah. Well, let's talk about what that means in just a minute. So the first thing that we're going to need is to scroll down the page and actually download Pro Tools first. So the first thing it's going to do when you click that is ask for a pop-up. We're going to have to show that pop-up. So you're going to have to create an Avid Master account because I'm guessing you probably don't already have one. Uh, that's free as well. Uh, it sends you an email. You verify your email address. Uh, you fill in massive a sheet full of details. I mean, if, if you're not paying money for it, they do want some sort of payment for this. And the payment is data, really. Let's be honest. They want statistics. They want to know where you're from, how you plan to use it, so that they've got all these numbers that they can show to shareholders and people like that. That's got some worth to them and that you're not actually paying them some cash. Uh, then, step four, this is an interesting one. Create a new iLock account or provide your iLock ID. If you're just starting out with audio production, you probably don't have an iLock or an iLock account. If if you've not, and you've not seen one, this is an iLock. This is a Generation 2 iLock. The Generation 3 is also now available. You don't need one of these to run Pro Tools first which is good, but there are two parts to the iLock system. One is this iLock dongle. Uh, the other part is the software, uh, which if I bring up the iLock license manager, which you would have to download, I'll uh, blur out my email addresses and such, but that's going to come up. If I plug in my iLock right there, it might take a second, but it should come up. There it is. So on my uh, stick, my dongle as it were, has all my plugins activated right there. As you can see, I have quite a few, but then I do do this for a living. Uh, Pro Tools First is one of them. And if you look, when, when you've signed up for an iLock account, and then you well we'll come back to this in a minute actually because you need to download the software you need to sign up for an iLock account but then once you've done that you download and install Pro Tools first so you hit get started now you go through all the steps I've already done all of this to save time uh, and also to get Pro Tools first working and make sure that I could find my way around it see what's limited yada 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 so I can show you so I've gone through all this so then I installed Pro Tools first, and as part of the installation, it tried to install this software, which I already had, so no big deal. You sign into it, and if you've given Avid your email address that your iLock license manager is attached to, then one of the li when you sign into the iLock license manager, which you probably had to restart, uh, this is the same for Windows and for Mac OS, by the way. This is entirely platform independent. This is the same either way. Uh, Pro Tools first will have been sent to your iLock account. You have to activate it. 
now you have two choices. And you, you, you see these icons here. Some of them have little uh, lit up icons and some of them don't. Um, if it's got the one on the left, the very far left, that's the iLock dongle that I use. The next one is the old iLock one, which a lot of uh, companies don't use anymore. And the next one, the square one, that's the computer icon. You can actually activate uh, an iLock license on a computer if the manufacturer of that plugin or software allows it. A lot of them don't, some of them do. Uh, so as you can see here, all my sound toys ones, they do allow that, but the Slate Everything Bundle, for example, they don't. So I'll just deactivate mine first, which you won't do. This is just so that I can show you step by step uh, how to activate it. Because if you run Pro Tools first without an activated license, it just won't work. So if I click on the big blue bit up top, again, my email is obscured, but it says how many licenses I have, including trials and demos, which is quite annoying. Um, I've got a few hidden, including things like I had a Pro Tools demo for the full version, uh, which you still had to activate via iLock. Anyway, uh, Pro Tools first comes up here, uh, zero out of three activations used. So I could actually activate this on three computers, which is nice. Because it means that I could then move from a laptop to a desktop machine and they would both work with the same account. So I have to select it in here, right click, activate. And then that takes a little while to come up. You need some patience. Uh, so Pro Tools first, Avid. You have, in my case, two locations to select from. That would be the computer's name or my dongle. You would probably pick the one that's your computer's name. In my case, I'm picking the dongle. Confirm activation, yes. Uh, so that then means that that's active, which means that when you then run the software, the software will ask the iLock license manager for an activation somewhere. It will talk to each other. They will sort its their, their thing out and it will launch. Nice and simple. Took a bit of getting there. But this now means that when the software opens, you don't have any serial numbers to put in. You don't have to do any registration. That was the registration. And the reason that I use an iLock dongle, partly some of the plugins that I use, that's the only thing they support. And partly I can then take that dongle out with all my licenses on it and plug it into another machine and carry on working, uh, which is great because that means that I can be in the studio or I could be working on my laptop and not have to pay for every software license twice. Anyway, so let's type in Pro Tools first and open this up. So, um, I have an audio interface and I highly recommend that you get an audio interface of some kind if you don't already have one. Oh, this has just disappeared to the back. It's scanning plugins which is a strange thing because it pretty much can't use any plugins except for its own inbuilt ones, which is something that's worth talking about. Because I have all these extra plugins like the Slate Everything Bundle and Sound Toys. You can't use them in uh, Pro Tools first. Be aware of that. If you've not paid for a plugin through Avid's Marketplace, you probably can't use it in Pro Tools first. Anyway, back to the subject of the interface. I am using an Audient ID4, I'm gonna hold it upside down here because it's held, it's plugged into the computer on quite a short lead. Uh, but this is plugged in to my streaming setup. We usually you just use the headphones. I'm using a slightly more complicated setup which you don't need to worry about uh, because it's unlikely that you're going to be doing things this way around. Uh, but I've also got a an acoustic guitar plugged into channel two and a microphone plugged into channel one. So I have the option of recording things uh, where I am. I am currently in what I call Studio B, which is my uh, home setup. Now, this has come up with the dashboard. Uh, the first time it opened, it came up with a choice. Let's just cancel that for a minute. So the first thing that you want to do is uh, when Pro Tools first opens for the first time, it will choose a playback engine. In my case, on Windows, it can be Windows Audio Device, which is to say it'll just come out of your 
laptop or desktop's general audio. Not the best, but it's a workable solution if you're not going to be recording actual audio, if you're just going to be using the MIDI virtual instrument side of things. It works. Uh, I also have ACO for All installed, which is a great uh, way for getting low latency audio without an interface. Which sometimes again I'll use if I'm on the move and I quickly want to just check a mix and I don't have time or, or even if I just need to change something, I don't have time to be getting out my interface and setting everything up. Uh, and then in my case I have the Audient ACO drivers, which are important for the Audient interface because they are the most efficient way for the interface and the computer to talk to each other. Uh, the sample rate, there is a choice. Usually I go for 44.1 or 48. 48 for film, 44.1 for music, generally speaking. Uh, but again, that is that is now set up and done. If your hardware has a, a set of uh, things like latency, buffers, all that kind of stuff, you'll find that under setup and hardware. And it's best to try and set all that kind of stuff up before you open your projects. It just makes life that bit easier. I've had experience in the past of Pro Tools not liking it when I make changes there Bef uh, in the middle of a project. It can then uh, refuse to play back, it can crash, need restarting. And that's all the way up to the most recent Pro Tools 12. It can still be quite fiddly. So, let's go to Create New. Now, you can see in Open, I've already made a project called Songwriter. Now, if I go to Create, there are templates here, uh, which is, is a nice thing, I guess. Especially if you're not someone who's used to using DAWs right from the off with a complete blank setup. Uh, so I did the Songwriter one, so I'm going to do that again. So I'm going to click Songwriter, call it Songwriter 2. Uh, now you see it says one out of three projects. Here's one of the catches of Pro Tools first. You're only allowed to have three projects. Which seems very strange to me. Considering that something like, you know, GarageBand allows you to have as many projects as will fit on your drive. Uh, it just seems a little odd, uh, but that's avid for you. And notice that here is an Upgrade Pro Tools button. Uh, as far as I'm aware as well, you can't import a Pro Tools session in here. Uh, it says Convert Session. I'm not sure what Convert means, from what to what. But if I hit Create and use this template, this will then take a little while creating me a project, making every track. Some inputs or outputs may become inactive because your audio hardware device has changed. Some inputs are missing. Don't need to save a detailed report. That's fine. And here we have the two windows that Pro Tools revolves around. And that is on the left here, the edit window, and on the right, the mix window. These are the two windows. If you've ever seen my Reaper tutorials, and I've used Reaper a lot, so I consider myself to be a fairly seasoned Reaper user. And I've explained the, the kind of concept difference between edit and mix before, where the edit window is where everything goes sideways, uh, left to right, and you can see all the notes, you can see the audio. Whereas the mix window is everything, the tracks are kind of vertical, and they're designed more for you to be changing effects, changing levels, uh, essentially mixing the two being very separate. Uh, one for recording the audio, editing the audio, making sure that each piece is played back properly. And then the mix window, uh, if, if I was to make the mix window full screen so we can't see the edit window and we just hit play, I hit spacebar there, we can see the meters going, but we can't see the audio, which means that we could work blind, as it were, which is the way that a traditional engineer would mix off a tape machine. It can be a good way of thinking. And this way, we can look at the effects that are on each channel, which are the inserts. We can look at the separate channels, that is to say in this case the sends, the reverb, the delay and the chorus are separate there at the end. And we can 
decide how much of each track gets sent to those reverbs, delays. Uh, we've got the faders here so we can decide if we want something to be less loud. For instance, in this case, I'm going to make my drums less loud by sliding that down. As I move a fader, you can see there's a number below it that changes. That's gone from 0 to minus 6.2. So roughly, I've taken away six decibels of volume from the drums, and if I hit play now... Hello? That's now quieter. An interesting quirk of Pro Tools that's always kind of annoyed me, I'm sure there's a way to fix it, but I've never looked deep enough, um, is that as I change the volume of the drums as it's playing, the meters don't change. Although you can see the master fader, which is where everything goes in this case, uh, everything that would be sent to a mastering engineer, sent to release, comes out of the master fader. You can see how I've turned the drums down. They are quieter coming up the master fader. I suppose in a way it's useful that I know even when I've turned a track down that it's got audio on there but it's not an accurate representation of what I'm hearing, which is a thing. So the, the songwriter preset, as we can see here, comes with a drum track ready-made with drums already on it, uh, which is unusual, I thought, for a template. Uh, there's a bass track, which is MIDI, a piano track, which is MIDI. Then there's rhythm guitar, lead guitar, male and female vocal, and a couple of extra audio tracks before the click track and all the extras at the bottom there, which are for extra audio. So with it being a songwriter preset, this, this kind of works for me. Uh, it's a little stripped down, it's a little simple, but there, there's a lot going on at the top. This is Pro Tools for you. There's a lot happening on this top bar. And it's probably worth me doing some explanation of what there is here. So, if I drag tracks around, uh, I've what I first did is I selected the different tools at the top. So, there are different tools. This is the hand tool, and the hand tool moves things around. Then there's the waveform tool, which can select a little section. If there's a uh, wave audio there, and there will be in a second, we'll get to recording some. That can select a little section of it without moving it. And then there's the trim tool, which is how you uh, make things larger and smaller. Let's undo that. But yeah, there you go. You can make things shorter. Or if you click just above them, you can have all three selected at once so that when you hover over a relevant part, uh, the relevant uh, tool is selected. So if I go further down on the waveform, it's got the hand. If I go further up, it's got the select. If I go to the end, it's got that trim thing going on. There we are. And that makes it more useful. So I almost always have that selected. Now, if we hit play from the big, ah, something that's worth mentioning now is there's the blue bar, which is the time signature. The green bar is the speed. And then just below that is the transport, as I call it. I'm sure there's another name for it, but it's called the transport in most DAWs. And where that blue arrow is when I click on a bar number, that's where if I hit play, it's going to play from. So if I don't want to start the song all the way from the start, maybe I just want to play a chorus, which might be here. I might click on the timeline there and then hit play and you'll see the bar move across the screen from that point. So spacebar is one of my favorite keys. It's start and stop. Saves me having to go up and reach for the play and stop every time and have to find it. Especially if I'm in the middle of doing something else, it just saves me a lot of time. Click, click, click. So we have drums. Uh, if I was to double click on that, that comes up at the bottom with, if I make that a little bigger, a MIDI editor where we can see just going to have to make this window a little smaller to fit on my screen, which is a little strange because my screen is uh, 1920 by 1080. But you can see... If I click on the piano roll on the left, the drum kit's already set up with all the separate 
drums on each key. If I click on one that highlights all the drums on that particular, uh, all, all the notes that are that particular drum, it's probably the best way to explain it. And if we look at the bottom, you can see these little lollipop sticks with the uh, diamond on the top. Those are the velocity. Those are how hard each drum's being hit. If they're higher up, the drum's being hit harder. If they're lower down, that drum is being tickled. The same applies for any MIDI instrument. So the same applies for the virtual bass, the virtual piano, virtual any instrument, virtual synth, you name it. Uh, the I, If I hit play, bum, bum, I can see the kick drum here and that that uh, rim bump on the snare. I can see the length of them bum bum ka bum 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 ka 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 bum, and I can almost read them uh, before they come up. That's just a learned skill. That's just visualizing what you see. Uh, these big uh, lines at the end of each bar, so I can see the division of uh, each bar. So I can see one bar, two bars, three bars, and four bars, and so on and so forth. At this point, it's probably worth talking about the speed, the tempo. So maybe the song's too slow for us. So what we're going to do is look at the top. So if we look at where it says meter, that's four, four. Let's not change that. But what we're going to do is we're going to change the tempo. So where it says a quarter note, is at 130 BPM. That's the speed we were going at. Let's make it faster, let's make it 150. If I just type in 150 and hit enter, you see how all the MIDI just shrunk down then? Because everything's going past more quickly. If I hit play, this will be faster. It's actually quite a useful little trick. Um, if you want to make quite an intricate part, maybe an intricate drum part or an intricate piano part or whatever, and you want to hear it broken down, is maybe make the tempo a little bit slower. Uh, listen to it so that you can hear it's been made right, and then speed it up afterwards and get that feel you were after. It's a nice neat little trick that I've used over the years. Uh, so, we now have a drum part, and let's close down this MIDI editor. Uh, so, where these three dots are here, that opens up a little sub menu. There are a lot more buttons here, and one that's blue is MIDI editor, so I can just click that and that gets rid of that. What's transport? Ah, transport is a separate window that essentially copies all of this stuff from up here. And if you're working across two screens or a really big screen, you can put that somewhere that's more efficient for you to look at. It's a nice extra handy thing. We don't need that because everything's up here in the edit window. Might be useful if we're running the mix window though. So what we might do is have the transport along with the edit window. That way we can see everything and still work. So yeah, on the edit window I can now see those drums. I can see where I'm stopping, rewinding a little bit, fast forwarding a little bit and so on and so on and so on. Uh, if we want to go back to here and track with a click track, the first thing we want to do is just under where it said tempo earlier, there is a little button. If I hover over it, it says metronome. If I click that, then hit play, there's our click track, which goes along with the tempo we've set and the count we've set. Personally, I think that click sounds terrible. So what we're going to do quickly is go over to the mix window and there is a track that says click. At the top of it is an insert. Inserts are either instruments or they're things like EQs, compressors, all the processing-y stuff that you would put on a single track. Uh, they all go in a row from the top downwards. And so the first one here is called click two. Uh, so, we bring that up, if we hit play, you can see it blinking along with the click there. Uh, so the volumes are here, so we might make that first click a little louder. And you can change whether they're uh, singles, doubles, 
Ah, it says follow meter. So if I unclick follow meter, I can change uh, how the click sounds. So if I make that uh, these uh, eighth notes, there we go. I can make these more laid back if you've got a drummer who prefers that, or we can make it more intense if you've got a drummer or a musician who prefers playing along with something that's a bit more, what's the word? If you've got uh, someone who pl uh, prefers playing with that eighth note beat, which might be useful for things like odd time signatures as well. They're right there. Makes things simple. But where it says classic click ack, I really don't like the sound of this. But if I change these, there are a load of options in here. So let's make it smooth stick and shaker, for example. Let's turn it back to follow meter. Yeah, there we go. If we go follow meter, when it's on follow meter mode, the, the first beat of the bar is accented with the top one and the rest are all the bottom one. And marginally better. I mean, anything's better than that original jig jug jug for me personally. Maybe it's because I've heard it for thousands of hours, but it drives me insane. And that little metronome button that was on the edit window is also copied over on the transport. Once you've recorded your part with the click track, if you decide then you want to actually hear the song without it, you just click that again so it goes grey, and that's gone. Now, let's add a bass track to this. Uh, let's right click on where the little keys are and make it extreme. Now, if I drag up and down on here, we can see the number two, the number one, the number three. Those are the octaves. Um, so if you go down to the octave number one, that's down here. Octave zero, too far down. Sounds like blah, blah, blah. Octave three is too high up. So that E there sounds decent. So how do we write in a bass part without actually playing it on a MIDI keyboard? Because let's say I don't have one. For, I mean, right now, uh, where I am, I don't happen to have uh, a MIDI keyboard with me. So what we do is the tools at the top, there's one that's a draw. So what we want is to zoom in. Let's make a bass note right at the start. There's a whole bar long then make another one, then a B, then an E, then a C sharp, an A, a B, and another E. So a nice simple pop song layout, dead simple. So if we hit play from the start, those are all a bar long, which is a bit boring. But what I did there is I clicked with the pencil and dragged them out. Hit Control and Z or Apple and Z for undo. Now, if you want to make them shorter, you can. You just don't drag the note out as long. And uh, where, on, on the top left where it says grid, this is an interesting thing right here. If I change the grid, it's currently on one bar. If I change that to a half note, or a quarter note, you can see how the the division has just become much more fine. Let's get rid of that transport bar right now, it's getting in the way. If I hold down the Alt key, I can zoom in and out with the mouse wheel, which means I can see more detail or see less detail. So, I can now make notes much shorter, so if I want to make something much more detailed, I can. And I'm just going to leave this like it is for now because the point of this particular video is not composition. The point of this video is getting yourself a practical beginning. So let's do a similar kind of thing, dragging out the bottom of this piano. And this already has... Oh.
Okay, so in the third octave, this already has the expand to plugin, which is the instrument with the natural grand piano. Probably not the best piano sound you've heard, but if you're just songwriting, if you're getting ideas down, does it matter? I mean, if it's just for, for you to listen to and appreciate, then I'm sure it doesn't. Uh, when it comes to professional releases, it may be more important, but at that point, you'll probably be looking for better instruments, better, you know, you'll start buying things, you know. So, let's just zoom in. And let's just draw a few of these in. So that's bar one, so that should now go bang, bang. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. So let's open the MIDI editor for this. And let's make that first note louder, second note quieter by changing the velocity. And that, lo that fourth note louder. Why not? Just because, just because. Now, if we look at them in the, not in the MIDI editor window, we can see if I just click somewhere else with the usual tool, you can see that the darker blue ones are the louder ones and the lighter blue ones are the softer ones. So you can actually see at a glance which ones have really been hit and which ones are nice and soft. Useful. Uh, so, let's zoom out. Let's close that MIDI editor again because it's getting in our way now. So what I'm looking to do is select these uh, copy and paste, maybe? Will that work? Uh, on this track? Yeah, so if I, I hit Control and C, Control and V. If you're on a Mac, that's Apple C, Apple V. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy paste this several times and use it as what's called in musical theory a pedal tonic. So I'm just going to have it play the same note over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the mix window and just turn that track down a bit. Because otherwise it's going to get really annoying. Also, we've got, a, now we're looking at the mix window again, we've got this reverb, return, delay and chorus, which are on bus 1-2 bus 3, 4, and bus 5, 6, which we can see all the sends here. So I'm going to send some of this piano to the reverb. So if I click on the sends A to E, where it says bus 1 and 2, that's what the reverb is. And if I just turn that up, there we go, you can, you can hear how that's really reverbing now. And do the same with 3, 4 to get some delay going. Okay, I'm not a big fan of that delay sound, but where that delay is on that channel is mod delay three. If I click on it, it's giving me a time. So let's have a look at this. Let's keep this simple. This, this is the delay, so it's going ding ding. If I slow that down somewhat to, I don't know, nearly 500 milliseconds and add some feedback, which is the FBK. So instead of going ding, ding, it goes ding, 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 and just keeps delaying a bit. Uh, if I sync it, yeah, so it's synced to a note, which is 400 milliseconds. Right, okay, so that's now got that ding, 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 ding. Cool. I think it's time to look at some audio tracks now because now we've got, if I zoom back out, we've got a, a drum track, we've got a bass line, and we've got a, a piano. So, where the pianos are, these are getting in the way. If I right click on this, I can change this to be small. Right click, small, 
and that puts them, so they are just physically smaller, so they take up less screen space. So the next thing we want to do is I want to record a rhythm acoustic guitar. I'm just gonna go and grab my guitar, one second. Here I have one acoustic guitar. I'm gonna plug in. So I've plugged the jack from the Pitso electric output on my acoustic guitar with the volume turned up into input two on my interface because that's the one that's got a DI channel ready. So I can hear that through that microphone, you can hear that, but we can't see it in Pro Tools yet. So what we have to do firstly is hit the record button. Ah, can't be record enabled because it doesn't have an input and an output assigned. So this track has an output assigned. We can see it lit up as out one and two. If I click on input, it's giving me a choice. So the, I'm going to the interface and analog two is channel two. So analog two is ready. If I hit record, ah, I can see level. So if I just set the gain on my interface using the gain, oh. Turn that down a little. Okay, so that's ready to record. So let's let's just make that uh, bass track bigger so I can see and remind myself what uh, notes exactly we we're using. Just use the hand tool, does that? Allow me to oh, I just drag the keyboard down a little. <laughs> Moves a little too quickly for my taste. Unless you're absolutely pixel perfect. There we go. <laughs> Done. Now, if I was to hit record, then I would be struggling to get my hand back to the guitar in time. Let's take that gain down just a little more, just to make sure we're firmly in the green zone. We don't want to be anywhere near clipping the interface, that's always bad. So we've now got our uh, track record enabled. So we want to be right at the start of the track, and I want it to give me some warning. So I'm gonna turn on the click, and I'm gonna turn on right at the top, there's this count off button, which is gonna give me two bars. So only during record, two bars. So what that's gonna give me now is plenty of warning before it starts recording. So that should go record, then play. One, two, three, four. Okay, and we hit stop, and that is our rhythm guitar part. So if I untick record enabled on that, so we can't hear it coming through anymore, which means that I'm then safe to unplug the guitar and put it over to one side. Actually, no, I'll not do that. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the exact same thing, uh, but with the lead guitar. Uh, so, Got to do the same thing again, got to get used to this, so interface analog to mono, uh, get that recording. Just hit play just to listen back quickly.
This is starting to turn out quite nice. Ooh, you hear how the preset's got some reverb and delay on it already, that's nice. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this lead relatively simple. Turn up my headphone volume a little bit. And I'm just briefly gonna turn the microphone off so that you can hear just the output there. Okay, so that was a track. Let's make sure that record and input are off. Now I can properly unplug that, be rid of ye for uh, a few seconds. Okay, so let's have a look, quick listen back. Okay, so, doesn't sound amazing to me, but this is where if we go to the mix window, and just solo, S for solo, on that rhythm guitar. Let's have a look at what plugins come with Pro Tools first. Because, of course, there aren't that many that come with it unless you start to pay. This is where the trick of uh, the magical uh, the Magical Pro Tools first comes in because it's one of those where it now becomes the ecosystem. So let's start with the seven band EQ on this guitar. And I'm just gonna add a little bit of mid. Take it away even because that sounded muffly. Add a little bit of low end around 200 hertz ish. Add a bit of top, 10k. And take some away around that rattly 5k-ish region. Also use a low, uh, a high pass filter, there it is. Uh, turn that on and get that going to about 100 hertz-ish. Now I wouldn't expect uh, if you're in, if you're new to EQing for you to move nearly this quickly. This is more to give you an overview of uh, what's possible. And so let's put an after that EQ in the next slot. Let's go to dynamics and use a compressor limiter and see what we get. So there's presets. Let's start with the acoustic guitar preset. See what that does. Not a great deal because the track's not very loud. So we need to move the threshold, which is this little yellow arrow down a little. And then maybe we'll bring up the gain a bit afterwards to compensate. Uh, let's take that annoying metronome off. And then see how this sounds. Let's take out that lead guitar for a second and see how this sounds in context.
Okay, it's getting there. It's starting to feel a little bit mono-centered, so I'm gonna use the pan knob here to take that guitar off to the side a bit. And I'm gonna do the same for the lead guitar. Let's just see, will it let me... Is it Alt? Yes, if I hold Alt, and drag these over, it lets me copy them. So I can copy the, the effects on the rhythm guitar to the lead guitar. I'm gonna go into the reverb and add a load more, and same on the delay, and move the lead guitar over to the other side. So we're starting to build a composition here, pretty useful. So this is where it's gonna get a little strange for a second because I'm gonna record a kind of a Scooby-Doo bap vocal uh, just to prove a point and I'm not gonna use the shotgun microphone that I've been using so far. I'm gonna bring in uh, this beast if I just drop it down. Okay, there we go, this is my uh, SE Electronics X1A. It's a very affordable microphone, uh, which doesn't mean it's bad. It's uh, for the money. I think I paid £80 for it. It's a great mic. Uh, this is the XLR version, which goes into an interface. This is not the USB version. I've never been a fan of USB microphones. I don't think that they're, generally speaking, up to standard. They've got quite a lot of noise on them and other problems. If I just whip the... Uh, foam guard off there. I only really use the foam guard when we're uh, doing podcasts and live broadcasts and things because it's a lot less messy than uh, using a, a separate pop filter which I, I always use a pop filter in the studio because they also give you some distance from the microphone to measure from and are generally a bit more effective but it's more of a radio thing to use a big kind of sock like that because it it means that then you've got people who can get closer to the microphone. So I'm going to hit record on, well, firstly on the male vocal, I'm going to set the input to analog one because analog one on my interface is where this microphone is plugged in to. I'm gonna turn the gain down on it. I made sure I got phantom power on 48 volts because this microphone needs it check whether your microphone needs 48 volt phantom power. A lot of condenser microphones like this one do. Uh, dynamic microphones generally don't. And with rhythm ribbon microphones, you can actually damage them. Anyway, I'm gonna turn the microphone that I've been using off and I'm gonna bring in the other one. There we go. Okay, so that's got some latency on it. Blah, blah. Nah. But that's that's to do with my settings in the ID4. I think I can reduce that one second. If I go into the ID set latency 256. There we go. That's much more reasonable. 256 sample latency is not quite giving me a headache. Um, I've not really used high latency stuff in a long time. It really makes me it makes me have a sore head. Okay, so if I turn up, there we go, turn up the uh, gain on my interface until I'm in the green but not clipping, because clipping is about the worst thing that you can do, because it's unrecoverable. Uh, clipping in the analog domain anyway, which is to say actually clipping in the interface, generally a bad thing, unless it's the specific sound you're going for, which is unlikely. So... Uh, we've got input monitor on, we've got an EQ which has already been set here, which seems a little weird. If I turn that off, the bypass button, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, so it's been set to give us a little bit of presence and a bit of thickness to poke out the mix. And I'm not hearing any reverb or delay. Let's go back to the mix window and just turn these sends up, one, two, there we go. And a bit of, bit of delay. Oh, a lot less delay. Oh, oh, there we go. Just want it to be a little bit spacey, we don't want it to be crazy. It's one of the things that I find with a lot of uh, 
artists is that generally speaking, when you're first starting out, you use far too much reverb and delay. I like to have some as what they call comfort reverb while I'm doing this kind of thing. And then generally in the mix stage, I'll take it down unless it's a, a deliberate effect. Anyway, let's put the metronome back on just to give us that count. We are back at the start and we only have this track with record enabled. Let's go. Some words I'm making up on the spot But you could have a song That you've already written Yeah Okay, so I'm going to turn record off on that note and bring back the other microphone. Okay, so let's swing that out. And that was a vocal. It didn't sound amazing to me, but then I am literally making it up on the spot. Like I said before, it's not a composition tutorial. This, this, The point of this is showing you how to get this working. If you've already got a song in mind, then who am I to tell you what you're gonna record? Okay, so let's turn that metronome off and the vocal doesn't sound amazing to me. A couple of reasons. Firstly, this EQ doesn't suit it at all. So if I put in a low pass filter, 100 and something hertz, that's a thing. Uh, the high frequency, the blue one here, if I just crank that gain and press the in button, it won't do anything until it's in. Let's see what that's got for us now. Turn that uh, orange one down, the low mids, because that's not helping. In fact, it's quite common for me to take some out at 500 hertz, what I call the boxy frequency. Cool, and I almost always... Uh, Oh, where it says like minus 11.6, that kind of thing here, if you click those to get rid of them, next time you hit play, it will show you the loudest that track got to. And yeah, I can tell that vocal's not particularly in tune, but again, not particularly relevant right now. Uh, so, onto dynamics, compressor limiter. Uh, let's look at presets. Uh, vocal comp. Right, so that's uh, 1.8 to 1. Now we want, we want to slam it at 4 to 1. It's got quite a, sl a fast attack, which is what I want, and quite a fast release as well. Let's hit play and see how that sounds. Okay, so I've absolutely slammed the <laughs> reverb on there and we've compressed it pretty hard. You can see the red going down to minus 12-ish. Um, I would personally prefer this to be some sort of analog style FET compressor, but considering this is free, I consider this to be, it is what it is. Okay, so something that's nice here is there's little notes so I can go acoustic lead DI in. I can leave myself little notes here to, to remind myself how it was recorded or what it needs or whatever you would leave, whatever you would use these note spaces for in the comments. 
like um for the main vocal rubbish <laughs> one take <laughs> so that's entirely up to you uh now this is pretty much coming up to the what i consider to be the limits of pro tools first i mean you can have up to 16 tracks in Pro Tools first, which for a basic type of composition seems absolutely fine. Uh, you can use four inputs at once, which when I'm at home, to be honest, I don't think I've ever used that many, let alone more than that. Uh, when I'm in the studio recording drums, I'll use somewhere between eight and 16 tracks at once. But when you're stacking them up, uh, which is the way that I tend to work, it's not about how many inputs you have, it's about the quality of your inputs. Which is where the Audient ID4 is really coming up a winner for me for the small stuff. And I've got all the Audient preamps in the studio going into the RME, you know, big setup. But that's a separate thing. Uh, so, the big, the big problems for me are when I go, I go to file and save, I don't get save as, I don't get any options as to where to save it because it saves this in the cloud. It saves it on Avid servers and it only lets you have three compositions. That's it. So you can't have more than three song ideas on this. You can't have more than three songs. That's the big problem for me. I think the general idea behind Avid doing that is to get you hooked on the whole Pro Tools thing and then you go, oh, well, this is what I want, but it's not doing enough. I'll go and buy the full version of Pro Tools, which is so expensive. Uh, and all it does is lift restrictions, really. It doesn't give you anything more than this. It just means that you can have more channels. You can use plugins that you bought separately with the full version of Pro Tools, but... If you've not seen Reaper, allow me to make a suggestion. Uh, Reaper is what I use day in, day out. Uh, I've been using it for quite a long time now. I think I bought Pro Tools, Pro Tools 9 or something like that. Pro Tools 9 LE or some, yeah. Around there, maybe even Pro Tools 8, I can't remember now. I paid quite a lot of money for it when I was quite young, uh, a young engineer. And I just hated it and found it difficult to get around. Whereas Reaper, um, where Pro Tools First is free, you'll run into limitations after three songs. Reaper is not technically free. You get a 60 day trial. But if you're making three songs and that takes you more than 60 days, then that's... You know, you know, the, mm -mm. What, but the thing is, after the 60 day trial period for Reaper has ended, it keeps on working. It just, it just keeps on going. Uh, it does nag you to buy it, but I think it's $60 was the, the, the last that I saw. And that's for the full fledged software, which doesn't, when you pay for it, it doesn't unlock any features because they were all already there. Um, it's so much more intuitive to me. And... Like I said, if, if you want to know how to use Reaper, I've done a full set of four tutorials on using Reaper. Um, I'll try and link the in the description because it's so much more productive to me. Uh, Avid are really, in my opinion at least, shooting themselves in the foot by crippling Pro Tools with Pro Tools first this much. If they allowed you to save files locally, if they allowed you to have maybe 10 projects or 20 projects, I can see it making people Pro Tools first users on a regular basis, which means that as you then get some money and get a little more into this and get older or whatever it may be, you are then much more inclined to buy Pro Tools. But if I was just starting out now and I used this, I'd be putting it down very quickly because the track limit is one thing, I mean, if you're an acoustic singer-songwriter, you might find that 16 tracks is plenty. That's fine. Uh, the four inputs thing is limiting, but generally, again, unless you record an acoustic drum kit, that's not particularly limiting. Three projects, that's massively limiting. And not being able to use external plugins is probably the biggest deal breaker for me because my entire mix almost now revolves around the Slate Digital Everything Bundle, which has every plugin that I need. I think I pay $15 a month for that, and that's, you know, not a great deal. 
and the Sound Toys 5 bundle, which I got at a huge discount when they were doing this kind of trade-in thing. And between those two, I almost don't use anything else. And I've used Pro Tools on someone's system where I've been brought in to do a mix. The, the session was already in Pro Tools. It wouldn't have been productive to export it from Pro Tools to another workstation. So what I did is I just installed the Slate plugins and the Sound Toys plugins and used them from inside Pro Tools and bang, I was off. And within, I think, 25 minutes, I was up and running and working almost as quickly as I do in Reaper or in Cubase, which is my other, my kind of, my second. Uh, although, you know, why would you have a second in this day and age? Um, generally speaking, what you would do is you would give a WAV file of every separate track to an engineer, which I don't think you can do in Pro Tools first. No, yeah, so... Uh, let's just use the multi-tool and select these. Can we export selected clips as files? Well, at least we can export separate files. That's something. Because you can't, as far as I'm aware, export this to Big Boy Pro Tools, which is really stupid. Whereas, you know, GarageBand, which is kind of logic but cut down, you can uh, bring a GarageBand file into logic and then make it kind of more professional from there. Uh, it just not being able to do that, it just seems like they're cutting their own nose off to spite the face. Which is absolutely bizarre. But I think that I've shown you most of what a basic Pro Tools first user would use and given you reasons, arguably, not to use it. But whether you use it or not is up to you. So I hope you found this tutorial useful and all the steps that went into it. So thanks for watching. And please check out the rest of our channel if you haven't already. It's Hop Pole Studios. And we do gear reviews. We do more tutorials like this for different software. We do... Uh, we do all sorts of stuff, bit of gaming here and there, but mostly stuff about, you know, mastering, mixing. We have our monthly guitar and tech news show where we talk about uh, what's new, what's come out, new products, uh, new developments in the industry. Uh, we also have our monthly Hopcast, which is guitar and tech news, but me and my assistant and good friend Christian talk about it rather than a news format, more of a conversational, detailed format, which also is going to be going out as a podcast. So check all that stuff out. It's all coming. And if you really, really found this useful, consider supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash hop poll studios. Again, the link will be in the description. That's kind of a donation thing that really helps us to do more of these kind of videos because the more we're supported by you, the more time we can spend helping out the wider audio community. So thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this, feel free to check out our other videos as you can find here, or check out our Facebook and Twitter, or our Patreon page, which helps us to make more videos like this. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.